Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a very warm welcome uh, to the Riga Conference 2018. In less than two months, uh, we will be celebrating Latvia's 100 years of independence. This year also marks uh, the centenary of our Baltic friends and neighbors, Estonia and Lithuania. At this historic moment of, for our countries, I want to take a short look back in history and see what we can learn. Latvia's century has not been an easy one. Independence was declared at a time when foreign troops were occupying our land. The first task of uh, new Latvia was to liberate our country from Bolshevik and German imperialists. There were no Latvian armed forces and in 1918 people were sick of war. Yet the cause of freedom was so strong that by 1920 a force of some 50,000 had cleared our land of enemies and uh, in August a peace treaty was signed with the Soviet Union. In January 1921, Aristide Briand, the Prime Minister of France and the President of Inter-Allied Conference, uh, signed a note regarding the recognition of Latvia de jure. The war of independence might have lasted much longer if not for the help of our friends, in particular Estonia, France, Poland and the United Kingdom helped militarily while others gave non-military assistance. After the horrors of the First World War, Europe felt safe again. Latvia chose a position of neutrality, perhaps ignoring the lessons of the War of Independence. The consequences are well known to us all. Half of our 100 years were spent under Soviet, then Nazi, then again Soviet occupation. We have learned this lesson of history. That is why when we regained independence in 1991, our main foreign policy objective was membership of the European Union and NATO. Twice in the century, together with America, Europe has defeated the tyrannies of imperialism, fascism and communism. So, at uh, this Baltic centenary, let us look more closely at the central importance of Atlanticism to our security. When we found ourselves left behind the Iron Curtain, the importance of the Sumner Wells Declaration of 1940 became clear. At that time, America was still unwilling uh, to become engaged in European latest war. But America and many others refused to recognize the annexation of the Baltic states by the Soviet Union. This was a lifeline which helped to keep the hopes of independence alive for half a century. More recently, many American presidents have played a huge role in the Baltic region. Ronald Reagan's principled stand against communism turned hopes of independence into a realistic possibility. This was realized under George H. W. Bush. Bill Clinton's personal relationship with Yeltsin helped the withdrawal of Russian troops from the Baltic states in 1993 and 1994. Clinton also resisted the marking of red lines as far as NATO enlargement to former Soviet states was concerned. In 1998, he signed the U.S. Baltic Strategic Partnership. 
later, the wholehearted support of George W. Bush was key to the Baltic states becoming members of NATO. The hopes of those who thought that membership of NATO and the EU alone would guarantee long-term security proved short-lived. While in economic terms we may be quite comfortable, wars in Georgia, Ukraine and Syria have shown that the world is a dangerous place. Moreover, ours is a dangerous neighborhood where intensified hybrid threats have been added to traditional military ones. Recent elections in some European countries have shown that Western democracies and the values on which they are based are under threat. When even serious commentators are writing that the democratic alliance that has been the bedrock of the American-led liberal world order is unraveling, it is fair to ask if we can still count on NATO and on the EU. Let me turn to NATO first. Europe in general has seen a gradual decline in the importance placed on security. Successive US presidents have drawn attention to inadequate defense spending. The result is that we find it hard to deal with problems as, such as the conflicts uh, on our doorstep in the Middle East. We even seem to be blind to the dangers at our heart in the Western Balkans where recently US help uh, was needed uh, to stop the biggest blood uh, letting in Europe since 1945. The conclusion, conclusion seems to be that NATO requires constant care, especially from the US. Yet Barack Obama's famous pivot along with unenforced red lines in Syria and then uh, Donald Trump aggressive rhetoric in Brussels suggests that this may no longer uh, be taken for granted. Yet I do not agree with the pessimists. Uh, let us look at the facts. Following the shock of uh, Russian action in Crimea and the Donbas, the Obama administration moved swiftly to provide much needed reassurance to the Baltic states. This was quickly followed by decisive action at the Warsaw summit uh, resulting in NATO's enhanced forward presence, a lesson in deterrence. Since coming to power, the Trump administration has followed strong Warsaw decisions. It has been forthright in demanding that Europe's allies pull their weight. Europeans have realized that we must take our defense more seriously. Most of all, President Trump has given a clear, as clear a statement uh, uh, in support of Article 5 as it is possible to do. In recent months, I have met with many U.S. officials and legislators. The wholehearted American bipartisan support for Baltic security is unquestionable. The reality is that we are no more secure than we were two years ago. As far as the EU is concerned, we have a number of serious challenges, as has always uh, been the case. Yet Brexit has not led to the breakup of the bloc, rather the reverse. Despite the rise of populist and uh, nationalist uh, movements, Europe remains democratic. Of course, staying together is not easy, but we how to work at it. 
celebrating this Baltic century, we celebrate independence, freedom, and our common values. People often ask, what are these so-called shared Western values? Well, I have speak uh, much about Americans, so I will end uh, with a truly outstanding American. In his farewell to the American people, Senator John McCain wrote of his heartful faith in Americans. I share that faith. He also wrote of his sublime happiness to be connected to, to America's causes, liberty, equal justice, respect for the dignity of all people. These are American values. These are European values. These are Latvian values. These are our values. Together, we must all uh, do all we can we can uh, to maintain and protect them. Thank you. And successful conference. Thank you, Honorable President, for your well thought introductory remarks. Uh, with this said, we have a first panel, opening panel, wonderful panel. And let me introduce uh, briefly our speakers today. We have uh, uh, Dr. Vairavich Freiberg, uh, whom you well know. She is a former president of Latvia and the president of uh, Club de Madrid. We have uh, Mr. Sven Sakov, director of International Center for Defense and Security in Estonia. We have Antony Mazarevich, former uh, Minister of National Defense of Poland. And we also have a, let's say, virtual speaker who appears to be Professor Timothy garten Ash, who unfortunately was not able to join us today, but still will have his address today. He's Professor of European Studies at the Oxford University. And uh, most importantly, we have a distinguished moderator. We have a pro Dr. Vita Matis, who is visiting uh, um, Professor at the Riga Graduate School of Law. Uh, with this said, Dr. Vita Matis, where you are, please welcome on the stage. Thank you. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, <laughs> right, looking at the wrong one, right on the other side. <laughs> right. A very warm welcome to you all, ladies and gentlemen, to this first opening panel of the Riga Conference, edition 2018. Um, it is fitting that in the year that all three Baltic states are celebrating their centenary, the Riga Conference, too, would be drawn to broad horizons, preferably involving the number 100. 1918 to 2018, a century filled with strategic lessons. Well, that's a very vast topic and, uh, you know, a uh, hundred years filled with lessons uh, can be intimidating for the most assiduous uh, among us. But luckily, we have today uh, the brilliant, as ever, uh, Professor Timothy Garton Ash, who has condensed these lessons of a hundred years into three salient points, into three main lessons, to three overarching themes for both small and not so small states in Europe. So before we proceed, with our panelists, please let's watch the video address by Professor Timothy Garton Ash to the Riga conference. Video, please. As one looks back at the last 100 years of European history, the story of Latvia and the other Baltic states is one of the most remarkable. 
not to have been shown on most, though not all, maps of Europe for nearly half that century, and yet to continue to exist and to come back as an independent state after the end of the Cold War. What are the strategic lessons from that experience and the experience of other small states? First of all, the absolutely central importance of political will, individual and collective. If you look at cases of attempted self-determination, which territories and peoples have succeeded and which failed, the question of will is absolutely decisive. But secondly, a strategic lesson is the one drawn by Czesław Miłosz in his great book, The Captive Mind. What most Westerners don't know, don't appreciate, is just how thin the crust of civilization is upon which we walk. How fragile is the ground of freedom, prosperity, democracy, peace. Uh, even when things look good. Uh, Miwash says we actually live on the edge of a, of a cliff like Charlie Chaplin in his cabin in the gold rush. And that understanding of how close we always are to the lava of tragic experience just under the surface, former Yugoslavia, wars and genocide, Crimea, the outrageous annexation of a chunk of the territory of a neighboring sovereign state by Russia, something we thought we would not see again in Europe, what's happening still in eastern Ukraine. All of that tells us the lesson of fragility. And that leads to the third great strategic lesson of the 20th century from the experience of small states and indeed some slightly larger ones like Poland, if we don't hang together, we will hang separately. And that hanging together has at least two crucial dimensions. The first is, of course, the West. Today, because of Donald Trump, because of what's happening in American politics, there's a lot of talk about European independence, or what in German might be called die Selbstbehauptung Europas. Well, I think we Europeans need to do a great deal more for our own security, but we should never nourish the illusion that we can do it all ourselves, that faced with powers like Russia, or indeed China and other great powers around the world, we need the transatlantic relationship with North America, the United States, but also Canada, more than ever. And secondly, the European Union. I'm afraid we are now in a phase of what could accurately be called European disintegration, of which Brexit is a particularly shocking example. Now, I still hope that Brexit can actually be averted, and there is still a chance of that. The least worst solution now would, of course, be for Britain to stay in the European Union. But if it happens, when it happens, then we have to make sure that Britain remains absolutely part of the European security community in all its dimensions. If we don't hang together, we will hang separately. I'm sorry not to be with you today, but I wish you a very successful conference and let's learn together the strategic lessons of the last 100 years. So as we see, Professor Ash has pithily summarized uh, the strategic lessons of the past 100 years in three points. You can argue that these lessons are no longer pertinent, 
Um, you can argue also that there are other more important lessons to be learned today. Uh, you can also argue that these lessons that he just uh, elucidated, that they have all been forgotten and urgently need to be reviewed. Uh, but I and we here on the panel will follow the path put forth uh, by Professor Ash. Firstly, the lesson of political will, both individual and collective. In 1918, in 1991, in the years leading up to uh, membership in NATO and EU, one could see in this region a very, very strong political will. But then the question becomes, after regaining independence and becoming members of all these adult correct organizations, has the region and the West in general lost its political will? Second point of Professor Ash, the lesson of fragility. If you noticed, he used the example of Miwash's book, The Captive Mind. But don't forget, The Captive Mind was written in 1952. And then, yes, perhaps Eastern Europeans were much more aware of the fragility uh, and how thin this crust of civilization is than Westerners. But that same Miwash in the early 1990s said something quite different. Uh, he said that he no longer saw signs of the awareness that suffering should bring among his compatriots. So one could ask today, are Eastern Europeans just as complacent and unawares as everyone else? Have they lost the sense of the fragility of their situation? And lastly, if we don't hang together, we will hang separately. The hanging together, of course, having two crucial dimensions, the dimension of the West and the transatlantic alliance and the European Union. Just so we all recall, here in Latvia, this hanging separately or trying it out alone, thinking that one could uh, be quite well with the path of neutrality and unalignment it, in 1939 and 1940, that didn't end quite so well. And similar voices today uh, are saying that, yes, we can go at it alone, no problem whatsoever. And the same voices are saying that, you know, are suggesting that we are hanging out with the wrong crowd, which could lead to a variation on Benjamin Franklin's famous dictum that if you hang out with the wrong crowd, you can also hang separately. So, to discuss these three lessons and how applicable or not applicable they are to the situation today uh, and for the next 100 years, we have three very esteemed panelists. So, uh, Mr. Bauman has already uh, introduced them slightly. We have Dr. Weir Vidya Freiburger, who was Latvia's leader at the beginning of the 21st century from 1999 to 2007 and is currently uh, the president of the Club of Madrid. Mr. Antoni Macarevich here next to me, who's currently, uh, well, uh, the deputy chairman of the Law and Justice Party, the largest party in the Polish parliament, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Um, and is a legendary figure in the anti-communist uh, resistance uh, in Poland uh, from the 1970s and 80s. And Mr. Sven Sakov, uh, currently the director of the International Center for Defense and Security in Tallinn, Estonia, a foreign affairs and defense think tank. Before that, he had an illustrious career specializing in defense and security issues. So including uh, leadership of the NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excel uh, Excellence, which will lead us very naturally into a very good question, which is, you know, cyber th uh, threats didn't exist 100 or 50 years ago. Uh, so all these lessons put forth by uh, Professor Ash, are they applicable to our situation today, or are there completely new dangers that we uh, had no inkling of in the past 100 years that we will be faced with in the next 100 years. So, one question to all three of our panelists. Coming from 
uh, Professor Asher's three points. Which of the three lessons outlined by Professor Ash seems particularly important for our time? And is it a lesson we have truly learned, or does it need to be relearned? Uh, or perhaps there's another lesson that is much more important than the three outlined by Professor Ash. Please, President Freiberger, your thoughts on this issue. Thank you, Madam Chairman, Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I very much enjoyed our friend Timothy Garton Ash's uh, summary of lessons to be learned. Uh, but I would not uh, wish us to limit ourselves uh, to just three uh, among the myriad possible uh, conclusions to be drawn from the past. Uh, first of all, I do believe we can learn from history, uh, but not in the same way as we learn our multiplication tables. Uh, and uh, the principles that we discover by analyzing history always have to be adapted and modified to current situations. So my lesson from the past period, whether the past hundred years or any other uh, epoch in history, uh, would be that uh, human beings have certain windows of opportunity to change history if they are ready for it. And that overlaps with Timothy's idea of the political will. It is not always political in nature. People are not aware that it is actually a political position they're taking. But a striving for freedom, for independence, for liberty, uh, for uh, individual rights, uh, that striving has to be there not just in a few uh, enlightened hearts and minds, uh, but in a critical mass of any given population uh, that sees the current situation as unacceptable, who desires something better, not necessarily clearly outlined exactly what it is going to be, but in the case of sovereignty and independence, the picture is clear enough of what you want, and then seizes the opportunities as they arise. Because it's not sufficient for a small nation, such as Latvia, a hundred years ago, or for that matter, Estonia, Poland, or, or Lithuania, to simply desire and wish devoutly uh, to be independent, to have the will to do it, you have to have the ability to do it. And this ability came for many, including Austria for that matter, to change its system from a monarchical imper uh, imperial one uh, to a republic uh, at the end of the First World War when we saw the collapse of a number of empires, the Tsarist Empire, the Prussian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and that was the moment when ten nations, as a matter of fact, not just these of Eastern Europe, but also of Central Europe, uh, took the opportunity. And they took the opportunity to put their hands to the wheel of history and to change the map of Europe, to make it different from what it was before. The fact that it only lasted 20 years until the next uh, war came along uh, was not really of their doing. And this is the problem of small nations being, if you like, the objects rather than the subjects of history or the other way around, depending on, on your philosophical bent. A small nation cannot always determine the events that happen in the world. They have to adjust to them, they have to adapt to them. One of the mistakes I think that a nation like Latvia made in that interwar period when it was independent is to hope that by remaining neutral, uh, its neighbors would leave it alone. That its goodwill and its friendliness, both east and west, its uh, unwillingness to get involved in any kinds of neighborhood quarrels would keep it safe. Uh, and that its borders and sovereignty would be respected. Well, they were not. Uh, they were already uh, breached by the secret pact uh, between Molotov and Riventop, to which uh, our colleague here uh, said he would be returning uh, later on. Uh, they were breached by the uh, territorial desires of Nazi Germany and those uh, of, Soviet, uh, of the Soviet Union. And then the, the ensuing, ensuing half a century of oppression uh, was one where uh, when Milos says that 
the Eastern Europeans, having suffered so much, should have been able to be sort of inoculated against all the idiocies coming from the West uh, and, uh, and to somehow become better than the Western Europeans ha had ever been under their system. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, somewhat like thinking that if somebody has had diphtheria as a child, uh, then they will be immune from a scarlet fever. It just doesn't work that way. If you live 50 years under an idiotic system like the communist system and you suffer all its consequences, when faced with all the advantages and the idiocies of the Western system, of course, uh, you cannot start cherry picking uh, and, and simply saying, oh, we will take this aspect of the free market and refuse another one, uh, or we will take this aspect of our security and not another one. I think the only reasonable choice for Eastern Europe was the choices that actually were made. Um, I am very glad to have participated in it. Uh, I am jolly glad that my country is now part of the European Union, uh, and never mind what the Brits decide, that's their life and their problem, but we, I think, our place is in the European Union. Our place is under the NATO umbrella, and we are most grateful uh, for the support, wavering as it may be at times, uh, of our neighbors um, and uh, those across the sea as well. One thing I may wish for is more solidarity and cooperation uh, among ourselves within the European Union or within NATO for that matter. And I just yesterday uh, heard the news of, of a person I've known as, an, uh, as a great uh, manager and a person of great integrity resigning from the uh, Baltic Rail, the Rail Baltic project because she feels that the three Baltic nations are unable to have sufficient economic will to work together on a project that Europe is supporting and that would be to the benefit of all. That sort of tendency to infantile selfishness and, uh, and self-centeredness, uh, the inability to look beyond one's borders to the common good, that is a serious danger that Europe has, and that is a danger I think that the Brits are suffering from, I th that President Trump uh, has been, uh, been bitten by that bug uh, as well. But we can always hope, and uh, I always think about President Trump, that his really um, good quality is that he keeps changing his mind. So whatever he says in the morning, you can always hope that he will say something better in the evening. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't have a Twitter feed here, but I can already imagine that there are many quoting the, if you had diphtheria as a child, that does not necessarily mean that you are going to be inoculated against uh, scarlet fever uh, as, an, uh, as an adult. Uh, so political will plus window of opportunity and thinking uh, more of the common good rather than of self-benefit. Uh, uh, please, uh, Mr. Sakov, perhaps you can comment on the fact perhaps those lessons are passé. I, I will try. <laughs> and, uh, thank you very much. And first, uh, uh, Mr. President, Madam President, ladies and gentlemen, good to be here. Um, first, uh, in very general sense about the, the free lessons. And I think it's actually one lesson and it is because of the, th the crust is very thin, we need to have a will individually and collectively. And basically, you know, the, 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 the famous saying by Benjamin Franklin, of we were, we hang together, we hang separately, um, is of course even more relevant for smaller countries which are very exposed to the history. Um, I will provide maybe some more uh, a foot for thought on the same theme, uh, which is um, you know, basically how can small nations survive um, and what needs to be done in order for international system for that to allow to happen. Um, and really looking back at 1918, which was a, say in the end a promising time for Europe, the long war ended, 11-11, Armistice Day, celebrated. Um, for Estonia, the Armistice Day is 3rd of January to, uh, one, uh, one, uh, 1920, 
than our war. Our war really started after the European big war ended. Um, and I think this is, you know, when we look at 1918, most of Europe, that was the end of war. When we are looking now at 2018, I am of opinion that we are back in a Cold War. I think in the future, maybe, I can be proven spectacularly wrong here, in the future historians will say that the period of time between 1991 and 2014 could be described as an inter-Cold War period. Basically, the history stopped for a bit and now it is moving back in the same direction. It should have started already or as it went back to old track in 2008, but the West ignored it to its own detriment because I think the, you know, the fact that 2008 was ignored led us to Crimea. Now, the, um, really when we look back at this, uh, the span of 100 years and maybe even a bit further, um, of course, the main strategic lesson for me from history, I'm a historian by my kind of basic education, is that we need to learn lessons from history. We need to learn the right lessons of history. And of course, interpretations are many. When people are looking at the kind of very nervous security situation in Europe, kind of the aggressive Russia, for example, there are people who are saying, aha, let's be very careful we might be sleepwalking into an next conflict. So they're thinking of 1914. The others, and I would fall in another camp, would say that we should not appease the aggressor because you cannot appease aggressor out of its aggressions. If you're too lenient to a bully, it will go on. And may I add another quote, I understand from Churchill, when in a parliamentary debate, he said to Neville Chamberlain, I quote, you were given the choice between war and dishonor. You choose dishonor and you will have war. Now, I think very often nowadays, also by the way in late 80s and early 90s, we in the Baltic States, we heard people, so-called so -called voices of reason, who said, let's be realistic. We heard it so much and we still hear it. I will say about that is in 1918, 1920, Estonia, went through a war of independence against Bolshevik Russia, against all odds. We won militarily. We are friends of our British friends and so forth, but we won. And that victory was won by idealists, not realists. First on the front line in the East were school kids. Their grandparents and fathers said, don't go, you cannot never beat Russia. They were the realists. I, let's say, fortunately, idealists did not listen and went to the front. 1939-1940, when we lost our independence, that was perpetrated from our side by the so-called realists, who actually lost it. Now to another lesson, and this is a lesson, I think, for our your American friends of the US, and I think you, you all know that, and it really is that Unfortunately, this is a fact that if you are leaving Europe, you need to come back. And when you come back, you come back under a machine gun fire. If you do not believe me, ask the war graves in Normandy. This is basically, uh, I hope, is not going to happen again. I hope this um, lesson will be learned. I think another lesson, strategic lesson really, is of patience, of kind of staying power. In July 1940, the U.S. issued the so-called Wellness Declaration on the non-recognition policy of the Baltic States, annexation of the Baltic States. It took 51 years, but it worked in the end, 51 years. And I think this is the guiding light for us now also when it comes to a non-recognition policy of uh, Crimea being annexed and occupied by Russia. I think um, every nation has its own cataclysmic events which stay in our memory and will is kind of forming our thinking. Uh, and for Estonians, I think it's the same for Latvians and Lithuanians, this is the fact that in 1939 and 1940 we lost our independence and we did not fight. This is basically this kind of Neville Chamberlain thing. And you know, uh, 
we chose dishonor and we had both war, dishonor, deportations. And basically when we deportation, Siberia is not just a geographical term in our minds, it's actually our part of history. And I think Estonia, I guess it is the same for Latvia and Lithuania. We have in our DNA nowadays uh, drawn the following lessons from that. The first lesson is you will fight, you need to fight whatever the odds. Finns, Finland fought, lost many people, a lot of territory, but they hanged on to the most precious thing, independence. Second is that since you are small, in order to be successful in a fight, you need allies, you need alliances. This is basically the hanging together part of it. Another lesson, and there are two more, so one will be ending in a, in a second, is that history very often sticks to us. Like, you know, if you are walking in a street and you step into something which is then not coming off, maybe something what the dog left behind, and you just can't get it off, and you're really annoyed. I think we, uh, you know, I'm sure that most of the audience knows that we, the best way to annoy Estonians, Latvians, and Lithuanians is to call them former Soviet republics. 27 years after that, it still happens. It happens on a daily basis in international press. Uh, I, you know, I hope the only way to mitigate that is that every time when, for example, the US press does, does that, we will call the US a former British colony. I mean, that would be the only way, I think, to kind of bring home the fact. The, um, and I think really now, coming back really to this hanging together, and I think this is the, the crucial lesson for small countries in a very turbulent world. A small country is very exposed to the bad weather in a bit bad neighborhood. And, and this is that we can learn to survive and prosper in a world which is governed by multilateral frameworks on three pillars, what we are all basically uh, uh, supported by. Bretton Woods, arrangements, NATO, and the EU. And I think when one of those three will start unraveling, when it's very hard to stay on a chair with only two legs. We need all three of us, and I think this is the ultimate, decision, uh, ultimate lesson that uh, we need to do whatever we can in order to keep that system alive. Thank you. Thank you. So Mr. Sarkov has added patience. We need to fight. Kind of counterintuitive, but both are crucial. And the need for multilateral uh, alliances for small countries, exposed small countries. Please, Mr. Macarevich, your thoughts on these lessons from the past 100 years. Thank you, Madam Chairman, Mr. President, Excellencies, dear guests. Uh, of course, I share the opinion of Mr. Timothy Garden Ash, absolutely, and uh, everything what was said before me. Uh, but I want to uh, show it problems from the geopolitical point of view. Because psychology, history, absolutely is uh, uh, valid. But the most important experience of uh, Europe, and especially of our region of Europe, uh, is uh, this activity which was uh, uh, known like the Pact Ribbentrop-Molotov. And uh, uh, we have to understand that this activity is still important and still very dangerous for our country, for Europe, and even for the peace all over the world. And if we will only uh, talk about psychology, absolutely. The will for the fight, the will for the independence, the patriotism, the unity, the solidarity, that is all, all absolutely important. I don't negate it. It was absolute. It should be absolute. 
but we have to see what is going on in geopolitical. We have to understand who is our political friend and where is dangerous movement which could to distract our peace and our independence. Thank you. Let's go quickly. So, what would you say is the lesson of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact? Uh, uh, you pointed to it as an example, but what is the overarching lesson that we need to learn from it? I will talk about it later. Okay. Yes. And <laughs> Thank you very much. So we have some other lessons that have been added to the three given us uh, by uh, Professor uh, Ash. Uh, and before I open uh, the floor to questions from our participants, which I've been asked to do at a, at a certain time, uh, would any of our panelists like to react to what uh, another panelist said? Uh, any reactions, Madame Freiberger? Yeah, I can actually uh, come oh, back sorry, to sorry. what you, um, what you uh, uh, said at the, um, at the outset. And um, that's a bit also about the fragility of our, of our um, uh, societies. And I think it's also um, partly due to uh, the very reliance what we have on technology nowadays. Uh, that was very different 100 years ago. 100 years ago, um, uh, you had chopped wood and you had a stove. Um, water is, was on a well. You did not have electricity. Uh, so you, if electricity went off, you did not notice, and so forth. I think nowadays, of course, they, uh, you can imagine that if electricity goes off in a major city, in Europe, what will happen? And how, co how quickly the very law-abiding citizens of that city will start looting because their kids are hungry. And of course, that can happen through different means. It can be uh, some natural cause, but it can be also, for example, a cyber attack. Uh, and, and I think this is basically uh, something which adds to this fragility that uh, a good professor from Oxford was talking about even more. I think the, um, the invocation of the Malta Ribbentrop Pact uh, is, uh, is important in the sense that uh, it has quite a number of, of conclusions we might draw from it. There you had two tyrants uh, whom uh, Europe likes to remember as being on two opposite sides. And I remember the uh, celebrations of uh, 60 years of the end of the Second World War where uh, the uh, victory uh, of uh, Russia over fascism uh, was celebrated. But this was a pact between communism and Nazism, uh, a pact where they decided on deciding, on dividing up uh, the rest of Europe. Now, both of them were bloody tyrants, and both of them had territorial expansionist ideas, and both of them intended to break the pact. But I think the temptation to engage in uh, these uh, conciliatory moves, whether truly genuine, uh, as hopefully uh, currently uh, European and, and our allies' uh, intentions are, uh, or deliberately uh, actually mendacious and false, the result remains that uh, sort of accommodating and trying to appease your opponent never works. I quite agree uh, with my co-panelists uh, in that regard. Uh, appeasement is an extremely dangerous game. Uh, it creates an illusion of having solved a problem. If we're nice to uh, a potential threat, uh, he will be or it will be nice to us. It won't. Uh, people and nations uh, who, for whom nice being nice and accommodating me is a sign of weakness and stupidity uh, are only going to take advantage of it. So I think it's extremely important that we always remain aware of the dangers surrounding us. Uh, we cannot uh, slip into the sort of uh, complacency 
uh, and, uh, and Sunderland self-satisfaction that uh, Gibbon in his uh, description of the fall of the Roman Empire said that the Romans had, had lost that uh, healthy vim and vigor uh, of the Republican era and so on. Um, I think yes, prosperity, uh, lasting prosperity, uh, increasing comforts compared to 100 years ago uh, tends to make people complacent. But uh, yes, indeed, uh, I agree with Timothy there. The veneer, or, or with Milos, if you like, the veneer of civilization is thin. It's thin in the east, in the west, in the south, and in the north. Human nature being what it is, uh, the dangers uh, of, uh, that may assail us from any part uh, of uh, any, any direction of a compass are present there. So one has to have solid foundations for one's nationhood, for one's alliances, for one's economy. Uh, one cannot afford to be self-satisfied, somnolent uh, and complacent. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you might say it's fatiguing, but stress is fatiguing too, and uh, stress leads to uh, exhaustion, whereas awareness leads to safety and protection. Thank you. Anyone want to add to that? Before? Thank you for this very elegant answer to the question of what is the uh, lesson of the uh, molotov uh, ribbentrop uh, uh, pact uh, and the comment uh, that the crust of civilization is thin, be it in the west, the east, the north, uh, or the south. Uh, for the audience uh, now, uh, implication of Mr. Ash and others is that those who don't uh, remember history are forced to repeat it. It's the famous quote by, I think it was Santa Yana. But there's also the flip side. You know, even those who remember their history sometimes have to repeat it as well. You know, it's not always just those who forget it. Uh, so please, uh, what are the lessons of the past 100 years and what are the questions that our audience would like to address uh, to our three panelists? I'll take a couple of questions to begin with. Uh, please, the gentleman here, here and here. We have three in a row right here and then I'll go to the other side. Thank you. I, if, uh, I'm James Sher from uh, Chatham House, uh, soon to be a colleague as well as a friend of Sven Sokov mm -hmm. uh, at uh, ICDS and the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute. I would like to come to a point that um, Sven made. I think one major difference between the current state of affairs and the Cold War is that the Cold War at every level was characterized by an absolute clarity of dividing lines in all spheres of politics and most spheres of economics. Whereas today this is not the case. Today it is very difficult to distinguish between those Russian businesses which are really businesses and those which are instruments of the state. It is very difficult in Europe to um, get an audience who, to accept that the Russian Orthodox Church is primarily an instrument, an important instrument of a state. And the, the major factor, I would say, is that in the Cold War, the critics of Western policy in the West were outside the establishments of the West. Today they are inside, as well as outside the establishments of the West. And that, all those differences make our challenges today more complex than they had been in the past. So I would be grateful for your reaction to that point. Thank you. Second question, that's right there. Tevan Pogosian from Armenia. Uh, actually, this is a question with the looking to the future. We're talking from 1918 to 2018, 100 years. In my view, it's four generations. The messages that we are trying to pass is message for the next generation what not to repeat or how to behave in a proper way. In this regard, what should we change in the system which is transferring this message to the next generation, I mean educational system, because we are trying to remember the past in the history, but each one knows his part of history. 
how to make that, that history and lessons and educational system will properly transfer these lessons into action. This would be my question to you. Thank you very much. Ambassador Takemans. Thank you. Uh, understatements, Latvian ambassador in Washington. Uh, my question to panelists is, uh, if you are looking back, it's 100 years ago, well, one lesson we have learned is that, in, pa in particular, Baltic states, that without friends and partners, uh, Baltic states in the, this, its history, uh, even having political will, uh, had no ability uh, to or shape its destiny like being neutral countries. Well, today, uh, after well, quite a lengthy pass of global processes and globalization, uh, now the countries, many countries, are turning back to their own borders. And uh, populist movements ignoring, are willing to ignore global processes. But as Timothy Gartner only a few days ago in Washington said, we should be prepared that these tendencies will last for quite a long time. What would be your suggestion, your forecast, or your advice to Latvia, to Baltic countries, where to be in these days, in this, this era of clash of global processes and uh, strengthening the national borders? Thank you, um, uh, Ambassador. One last uh, question uh, before we get to the responses. Thank you. Klaus Wittmann, Aspen Institute, Germany, and uh, po Potsdam University, and a former general of the Bundeswehr. Some people say, the, and this is mainly to Sven Sakov, whose uh, statement I found very powerful. Some people say the Baltic countries cannot de be defended, to which I say West Berlin also could not be defended, but there were allied troops, and so it was reasonably uh, secure. I would like to know uh, to what extent do you think that even small multinational battalions are sufficient for deterrence because they are uh, meant to send out the message that an attack against one would be uh, regarded as an attack against all? We had two questions addressed directly to Mr. Sakov. The first, uh, concerning the differences between the Cold War uh, and the situation today, and the last question uh, concerning uh, the comment that the Baltic uh, countries, states, cannot be defended. Would you care to reply to both, please? Yes, uh, uh, thank you. Um, uh, first, um, uh, concerning the question by um, um, James Sherr, uh, uh, of course, every different manifestation of history is, is different. And uh, probably this is the only quote which, where I find uh, Karl Marx to be compelling, and I agree with that's the only one, is that the history tends to repeat itself first as a tra tragedy, then as, an, then as a farce. Then as, then as a farce. Um, uh, present Cold War is different from the previous one because the rules are not that well defined, the borders are fuzzy, uh, and of course, um, that actually creates much more uncertainties and risks are very high. Uh, I would be really worried about something going wrong, for example, over the skies in Syria between the US and Russia, which basically can then spiral out of control. And that might have consequences far uh, and away from Syria, then this is not, if it is not handled uh, correctly. Um, and I think also the one difference is, as, as James, you, you alluded to, is that the, the West is um, much more divided, although it was also divided in a classical Cold War. You know, think back of the Reagan times at Pershing II and MX deployments to Europe, for example. Uh, but I think Nowadays, there are people who question the whole premise of, you know, what type of country are we dealing with, whether we can actually maybe just, you know, have business with it, buy gas, for example, so forth, be happy or not. Uh, so I think it is much more dangerous and we are at a weaker 
uh, position actually, uh, which is ironic because when you look just at the economic scales, it's very different. The West is so much pre so predominant nowadays vis-à-vis -vis Russian Federation. But you, in order to be effective, you need to will also to use the resources and the tools you have. And if you do not have a will, then your resources are of no avail in kind of big power competition. And then uh, next to, um, to, uh, to General Whitman's um, uh, question about the uh, small enhanced forward present tripwire force, what we have here, and whether the Baltic states are defensible. Well, I mean, uh, in Estonia we have been trying to defend ourselves against uh, one particular country since 1030. It was the first, I mean, historically, uh, historians nowadays tell that the first war of independence in Estonia was from 1030 to 1061. 1030, that was Yaroslav Mudry, Yaroslav the uh, Wise from Kiev, actually, who tried to occupy parts of Estonian territory. And that struggle we won. And the second one, in the beginning of the 13th century, we lost to Danes and the Teutonic Knights. Um, third war of independence in 1918, 1920, we won. Um, then, 39 and 40, I already said we did not fight, which was a tragedy. Um, I mean, in essence, deterrence of NATO um, works in an extended way. It has a nuclear dimension. It is not just about what you have in the country. Um, Baltic states are way too small. Uh, to have everything here what needs to be uh, in order to uh, defend them effectively. It has to be brought from outside. And I think as a tripwire force, uh, of course, the important thing is that if that is tripped, then what does it bring with it? What are the processes and actually readily available forces of allied countries to come here in order to uh, reinforce? I mean, maybe this is crossing a bit into the next panel's territory, which is actually looking at the NATO 100 years, but I would say that uh, certainly we should not be thinking that the EFB is done and we should be happy about it. I think there are so many critical capabilities which are missing from that package. It's not necessarily more infantry, but rather long-range fires, air defense, and things of that sort. Uh, so I think it's kind of, you know, um, in, in that respect, the, uh, the, the, the cup is half full. Thank you very much. If I may add to that, um, when, uh, when I took office way back in 1999, uh, the feeling was quite widespread uh, that um, enlargement of NATO had been very tentatively and very cautiously made, by including Hungary and, and Poland, and, and to see whether the, fall, you know, the sky would fall in or another war would break out and, 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 and Russia uh, would have fits and foaming at the mouth. Uh, they probably did foam at the mouth, but, uh, but uh, otherwise the sky didn't fall in. And, and then the thought about enlarging NATO became more and more serious. And, and certainly uh, we, uh, the candidate countries, uh, did our best to persuade uh, Western politicians of the member nations that it would be a wise thing to do uh, to enlarge it. Uh, uh, at that time, around 2000, a study was made in the United States, a confidential report about, guess what, is it possible to defend the Baltic states should they become members of NATO? That was a concern for, for, the, uh, for the Americans as well as for others. And the answer was by a retired general, and I, I quote him uh, from memory, uh, if NATO uh, could not defend the Baltic states once they become members, then NATO is finished as an alliance and it's no use to any of its members uh, because of that incapacity. If it is an alliance and a military alliance that is capable of defense, of collective defense, then of course there is no question that it will be able to defend the Baltic countries. The only question is, will the rest of the partners have the political will to do so? Uh, the deterrence aspect is important. It's not important how many uh, boots on the ground 
we have in the Baltic countries. Of course, the more the better, if you like, so that whoever is looking at it, uh, in case they miss them, you know, they, they, they're more visible if there's more of them. But the point of it is, if one American citizen gets killed, or one British citizen gets killed on Latvian soil, or Estonian or Lithuanian soil, by an attack coming from Russia, then ipso facto, it is a declaration of war, and that is the end of it. And it's no more a question of how many boots are here or there or elsewhere. The whole business of NATO, the whole machinery has to be set into motion. And God help us if it doesn't. Thank you. I just I like to, I yes, to please. continue. Please do. Okay, because uh, I think that it's absolutely most important things in our discussion and in our situation. Uh, of course, the NATO battalions are very, very important. It was the first step which changed the more, more dangerous situation which was in our region. But it was only the first step. The second step, which is before us, which we have to, 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 to do, is absolutely to obtain the, uh, 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 the basis of military basis of uh, US army in our territory. And it is the process which is now decided in this moment, in this month, and in this year. And uh, our independence and the future of Europe depends on, on, on this. If there will be the American bases in Poland, which means in all of this East region, region of, uh, of uh, uh, Europe. It's the first point which I wanted to continue your speech added. But is the next different problem which I want to put on the table because we told many things about the morality history and when you ask about difference between the uh, times of court war and, uh, and present times, I remember that there was such event in the first years uh, after the war, it was the first Nuremberg. It was the uh, decision which made the whole the world, whole the civiliz civilized wo world, to uh, uh, say that never will be absolutely uh, 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 um, tolerated such things as like genocide, atrocity of Germans, and everything what happened during the Second World War. And if we did it after the the collapse of Soviet Union with the atrocide, genocide, and everything what was de did by the Russian in our countries. I think that is the moment for the second Nuremberg, for the Jews of everything what was did by the Russian with our people, our nation, and our countries. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We have two questions that uh, were not uh, addressed. Uh, one concerning uh, the overall uh, clash of global tendencies and uh, where do the Baltics find themselves in that? Uh, and also uh, what special education uh, should we uh, <clears throat> give to our new young generation in order to deal with the lessons of the next 100 uh, years. Would any of our panelists care to uh, address one of uh, those two questions that were uh, asked and not answered uh, up to now? Mr. I am active in a, in a body called CLIO, which uh, is uh, an organization uh, where uh, teachers of history across Europe are members. And uh, it's been one of the concerns in uh, truly just about every uh, nation in Europe, both members of the Union and not, about how little many young people know about the history of their own country, about their own region, 
about the history of the world or their continent. Uh, it's clear that uh, in the, our modern competencies-oriented education, or an education that supposedly should prepare uh, students for the job market, which is a fine thing, of course, to do, uh, we should also have um, a basic education uh, in a humanistic sense, and that includes uh, one's own language, uh, one's, uh, the literature of one's country, the history of one's own country, and that of uh, of uh, Europe uh, and ultimately of the world. Uh, so that uh, neglecting history would be an extremely dangerous thing to do. Uh, apart from that, these generations now growing up are going to be uh, living in a digital world of information. Uh, and I think our educational systems generally uh, are bound to go through a series of uh, transformations and, and uh, uh, and revolutions even, uh, our minds uh, will be changing. Uh, we used to, our ancestors used to live in an in a oral mentality kind of world. And then since Gutenberg's invention, increasingly, uh, certainly the Western world has uh, had the literal, the written word, uh, literally influencing uh, our, our way of thinking uh, we use uh, the written word as an aid to thought, uh, as we used to use uh, speech as an aid to thought in early ages. Uh, by now, uh, the new generations are, are, are using electronic media. It is going to transform us. And uh, uh, as far as uh, uh, international relations, I think respect for law and respect for international law uh, would be very helpful, of course. Uh, as uh, just as much as uh, within, uh, for instance, the European Union, we do uh, concentrate on, on tolerance uh, and acceptance and inclusivity. The, uh, the Club de Madrid of, uh, have uh, some colleagues sitting here in the front. We have been working for a number of years on shared societies, societies where nobody is left behind. I think if we achieve those sort of societies, that should be uh, uh, as good an antidote as any uh, against future conflicts and conflagrations. Thank you. Mr. Sacco? Um, on the issue of um, history as a contested uh, subject, that was basically the gist of uh, what um, our friend from Armenia asked. Um, uh, uh, Yes, it is contested. It's heavily contested, not by historians, I would say, so much, but as by nations uh, for their own ideological uh, purposes. Um, give you an example from a very last week. Uh, it was the anniversary of the 22nd of September 1939, this famous parade by Nazi and Soviet forces in Brest-Litovsk, after basically attacking Poland from both sides, dismembering it, and then having a celebratory parade among two allies. Uh, and Associated Press had a story about that um, after heavy criticism from Moscow, they did delete allies from basically that story. And you know, if that was not a part of a kind of monetary bundle plaque leading to a attack on Finland occupation, Estonia, Latin, Lithuania, attack on Poland, you know, all agreed by two allies, then what is the you know, meaning of balances? Uh, and I think it's a, um, in a very contested issues of history, um, uh, a good example, what I have seen um, closer is that uh, the late President Meri of uh, Estonia, he called into existence the International History Commission on the crimes of occupation powers in the 20th, 20th century. And that was uh, chaired by um, esteemed uh, Finnish uh, diplomat Max Jakobson, who was basically published basically the historic, history studies on those uh, crimes, and, and that basically, I think, did a lot in order to put some of the very issues uh, at rest. Um, and one more thing I want to come back to, uh, to the, um, the issue of uh, US permanent base in Poland, which I think we should all support in this part of the world. I think this is a good idea, for the reason that the deterrence value of American soldier is higher than anyone else. Um, I just want to add that if that is going to be called Fort Trump, which I read from newspaper, may I just call that 
I think this is not the end of the story. We should have a Fort McCain in Estonia. Okay. <laughs> I support it. <laughs> right. Thank you for that. More questions, please. Uh, okay, we have one. The, it was the blue uh, and the blonde hair. Understand? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rasm Pipite, and I'm a civic activist since I was 17. And uh, listening to panelists, I really would like to uh, say that one of the challenges and uh, lessons learned, my personal lesson learned, uh, is that the shrinking space of civil society in Europe. Uh, this is really uh, shocking how governments are actually uh, financial-wise, legally, trying to push down the civil society of their own countries in Europe. And it's not done by some kind of external enemy. It's not done by some kind of uh, uh, means of arms. It's done by politicians. And so my question would be to distinguished panelists, what you would suggest to civil society to do what means they should do, uh, should take, and uh, use to sh to widen this civil society space, and also, I'm mom of three children. What should I teach them now about civil society and how it was, how it is uh, able to sustain itself in democratic environments? Thank you, Ms. Pipeke. Another question? Um, we have way in the, in the back there and then in the front with the hat here. That's, uh, and Mr. Kalnich over there. So we have four there. Um, uh, Karna Rushnovanu, Institute for Political Studies, Ministry of National Defense, Romania. Uh, I, my question concerns Russia. Uh, well, the main tendency nowadays is to look at Russia as the main threat, yes, against the international liberal order. Uh, at the same time, there are countries, both NATO and the EU, which are rather eager to accommodate Russia. So my question is, how should we look at Russia? Talking, of course, about uh, lessons of history, like a threat, like a challenge, or like a cooperative partner which is important in order to build a more stable um, security uh, European order. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman and then Mr. Kalnich. Bismillah rahman rahim assalamu alaikum and good afternoon everyone. I am Rahim and I am from Pakistan. Uh, uh, since the discussion is much more focusing the previous hundred years, uh, I'd like to ask a couple of questions from the panelists that uh, uh, besides what's happened um, uh, after the World War I and World War II and uh, of course the humans have uh, made a lot of technologies and we have like now in the, in the coming hundred years we'll be having like uh, countries with nuclear weapons and everything. So how do you see the role of international relationists in a, in a general perspective of saving the, the world from wars and bringing the peace which could like remain for a, a longer period of time? Uh, and, and secondly, how do you see the role of international relationists in, in keeping the world uh, safe from wars? Uh, particularly in a situation that do we have any international agenda for the coming hundred years that we could see that we have this particular program which could save or an idea the world from another war which could be more uh, disastrous than what we have seen in the previous hundred years. I thank you all. Thank you. And Mr. Kalnich. Yes, thank you. I ask Collins, Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the Latvian Parliament. Uh, you talked about the importance of Europe and the transatlantic alliance to hang together uh, so that we don't be hung apart. Uh, but 
the tendency in the last few years is for these forces to be pulled apart, and they're being pulled apart every day. Uh, there are a lot of objective internal factors why this is happening, whether it's populism or extreme nationalism, inability to deal with migration. Uh, but there are forces outside of our alliance who are equally interested in seeing us pull apart. And my question is, are they succeeding in exacerbating the situation? Are we aware that it's both internal and external? And are we capable of handling both pressures to deal with this? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pons. So we have the question concerning uh, the shrinking space of civil society, the question of what to do with Russia. Uh, third question, well, this more pertains to the next panel, what to do in the next 100 years, um, and how to uh, survive both external and uh, internal pressures uh, for uh, the disintegration of multilateral organizations. Would anybody like to go first with any of these four questions? Civil society, should Yes, I please. Um, Europe uh, uh, and, and the Western world generally uh, have, uh, I would say over the last hundred years, increasingly uh, relied on the input of non-governmental bodies uh, into the machinery of government uh, so that in between the periods of uh, official voting, when, when people vote for their uh, official representatives in their parliaments uh, and uh, through them uh, their governments there is a way of expressing collective will on various specific questions. Uh, I am not aware uh, that uh, in Europe uh, there is anything resembling an official um, antagonism uh, to civil society. Uh, I spent much of my life in Canada and worked in many bodies that were, I suppose, we didn't call it civil society, we called them voluntary organizations and voluntary bodies. And this is by definition how I understand it, is that um, government has a series of the executive branch uh, and ministries uh, that have various uh, resources uh, and programs uh, that they carry out uh, uh, theoretically uh, according to the will of the people uh, expressed in the last elections. Everything else in between is a voluntary movement by, by citizens and unless it is a totalitarian system, which I don't believe we have uh, anywhere in the European Union, uh, then we do not have any repressions against uh, activities uh, the freedom of speech, the freedom of expression, uh, the freedom of organization, uh, the freedom of devoting money uh, to causes uh, that you support. Um, so that, uh, frankly, I'd, I'd be open to hearing um, clearly what, uh, what the problem is. Uh, I'd like to say, just say two words about uh, the, how, what attitude we should take uh, towards Russia. I, I believe that when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, the whole world, uh, not just Mr. Fukuyama, thought that the things had changed. And of course everybody was, was thrilled at the idea that here was a country that would at last um, be open to democratic uh, developments, uh, that it would prosper, uh, that it would be a good partner. And, uh, and then slowly uh, we started getting signals uh, that our perception and our desire was one thing, but their goals and aims and their own perception of themselves play a crucial role. So that in our attitudes to Russia, um, it's not sufficient uh, to have goodwill on our part, which I'm sure we all do, but it's also necessary to watch uh, whether that goodwill is shared. It does take two to tango. Yes. yes. Maybe I will um, um, continue from uh, Madam President um, um, ended, and this is also a bit uh, um, in the direction of answering a question from our Romanian colleague. Um, recently, the, um, the President Clinton's uh, presidential library has been um, um, uh, put online all the, uh, the meeting memos between uh, Clinton and Yeltsin. We haven't 
looked at that, I strongly recommend it for instinct reading. Uh, by the way, it proves very clearly that the West uh, was trying everything at its disposal in order to accommodate Russia, to help Russia in the 1990s. Uh, it was basically bending backward in trying to ensure that Russia will be a successful democratic nation. Well, of course, the history turned out differently. Um, you know how to perceive Russia. I think this is a, um, we can perceive it either as it is. And yes, we, see, we saw people uh, in the West who would rather exchange their principles for cash or gas. Um, but when you look basically just in the last 10 years, a 2008 aggression against Georgia, 2014, annexation in Crimea and still ongoing war in Ukraine, 10,000 people dead. By the way, I don't buy those people who say that, you know, but it has been a, you know, a failure by Russia. In a way, yes, Putin has done more nation building in Ukraine than anyone else in the history. But I think if you would ask the relatives of 10,000 people dead in Ukraine, whether, you know, we have been actually that you know, masterful strategically on the Western side, I don't think they would agree. Going on in 2015, you know, uh, interference in a Syrian uh, war, propping up a murderous dictator who is gassing his own people. 2016, interference in US elections. 2018, using chemical agents on the territory of EU and NATO nation. Um, and if that is not a kind of pattern of aggressive behavior, then what is it? But I think really the question is in a economic and uh, self-interest of some groups and people in Europe, unfortunately. Uh, regarding the, the question from our friend from Pakistan on a future rule-based uh, uh, system in international relations and let's say also international law, I think you have to have two things. You have to have you know, rules and, 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 and international law on one side, then actually political will to uphold it, to underwrite it. And if you don't have that will, then things unravel. Uh, I think one specific moment in history in the last 10 years um, was really, really unfortunate. And I think we are still seeing the fruits of that. And that was in August 2013, when President Obama, despite having drawn a very clear red line, that if the chemical weapons will be used in Syria, US will act in order to uphold the CWC convention. And when it came into being, and in the East Quota, uh, thousands of people were killed by gas, US did not act. And I think that basically uh, is, we still feel it. We feel it especially in this part of Europe, because in the end, Article 5 of NATO is also a red line, which needs to be, basically, the, the, and the deterrence is in the mind of another side. And if this other side, starts thinking that maybe you are not carrying it through and carrying it out, or you're not ready to fight for that, then they might do a very tragic miscalculation and basically do maybe something that we will all regret in the future. So it's not just rules-based, but it's also will to underwrite it. Thank you very much. Okay, two uh, short, please. Uh, short points which... Uh, I want to add to, to, to this what was said because absolutely I agreed with uh, both of you. I, you asked about how you have to see the Russia. You have to see the Russia as it is, like the aggressor, the most dangerous aggressor which wants to destroy the Europe. And everything what was said about the Ukraine here, uh, we have to repeat it. We have to show it once more and once more. We have to wait that Russia will come to the Riga, to the Warsaw, to the Vilnius and so on. Uh, if we will not react on this aggression, if we will be think, eh, maybe it is something else, maybe we have to uh, uh, change our position and so on, we will meet them in our cities. That's absolutely uh, uh, obvious. And second problem, uh, uh, 
one uh, miss asked uh, what she have to say to their children about the uh, civil societies. You have to say that without the independence, there will not exist civil societies. First, you have the, uh, have the independence. And secondly, you have to build the civil societies. Thank you. Mr. Matarevich, would you like to address the, the question of the chairman of the Latvian Foreign Affairs Committee uh, in Latvian Parliament uh, concerning how to resist uh, the pressures, both internal and external, uh, that are leading to a certain disintegration of the multilateral organizations uh, that uh, tend to protect small states? Uh, it depends what... Uh you are thinking about the role of this in, uh, uh, international um, uh, organizations uh, because you uh, have to think, to, 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 to understand that there are such international, uh, um, international organizations which help to fight and to, uh, to fight with uh, uh, our enemies and there are such international organizations which help our enemies to fight with our independence and everything is the consequences of this diversification. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do we have time for another round of questions or not? Yes? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, the chairman uh, of the conference has just informed me that unfortunately we don't have time for any more questions. So I would just like to say that, uh, first of all, a huge round of applause to all three panelists. <laughs> And I believe the next panel is about how to apply these lessons for the next hundred years. And maybe the real lesson is that we have to keep relearning and relearning and relearning lessons over and over again. Thank you very much.